this talk is called Compositional Generalization in Minds and Machines. And thank you all for inviting me. It's very nice to be able to do visits like this. First, I wanted to mention my collaborators. Marco Broni has been my main collaborator, and I started this line of work with him. And there's also been a number of important student collaborators it's shown here on the bottom of the slide. And I'm going to point to their work as we go through the talk today. I want to understand systematic compositionality, which is the algebraic capacity to understand and produce novel combinations from known components. And this has been a very influential idea, both in linguistics and cognitive science. And the names on the slide have written about this idea extensively. And I want to give you an example. This is how you DAX. So I say I give you a demonstration of how you DAX, just like this. And now I ask you, can you DAX twice? Can you DAX while jumping? Can you DAX like you mean it? Due to your compositional skills, you can understand and produce the appropriate set of actions to follow each of these different commands. I want to know how people are able to do this. How are they able to pick up a new concept, a new word, and then use it compositionally with all the other things that they know? And what are the computational underpinnings of human compositional skills? So this is a talk in three parts. The first part is about, do modern AI models show this type of systematic compositionality? The second part, we're gonna ask, how do people do this? How do people make compositional generalizations? And then in the final part, I'm going to tell you about a neural network that learns to make compositional generalizations. It actually learns a type of compositionality. Let's dive into the first part. And it's worth noting that there's been a number of relevant earlier studies looking, about, looking at compositionality in neural networks. And the contribution here was to study the latest generation of models, in particular seek-to-seek -seek models, and pr proposed updated challenge problems to study compositionality and systematicity in these modern deep learning systems. And this was a paper published at ICML in 2018 with Marco Baroni, if you want to check out the details. And we created a test bed where compositional learning can be studied in a very pure form. And we called this the SCAN challenge for compositional generalization. And the key question behind SCAN is, can a model generalize and can it understand how to jump twice after learning how to walk twice and how to run twice and then how to jump on its own? So say you train a neural network to follow some basic commands and that if you give it the instruction walk shown over there on the left hand side in, in quotes and in blue and then map that to the right action to perform that command in this case the walk action primitive which is shown there in caps and then if you're asked to walk twice the system should walk walk and if it's asked to walk around to the left it requires a sequence of eight actions it has to make a left turn and then walk and a left turn and walk until it does a 360 while walking or turn left and walk opposite twice and so on. So as you can get the sense it uses walk in all these different compositional ways. And then it gets other primitives like run and it has to uh, learn how to run, run twice, how to run around to the left, turn left and run opposite twice and so on. So it gets several of these primitives presented compositionally in many commands. And then it also learns how to jump. But jump is going to be special. It's just going to learn to jump on its own. And that jump maps to the jump action, or maybe jump in just a small handful of instances during training. And then at test time, we're going to ask the network to generalize in a zero, zero shot way to new compositional uses of jump. So we're going to ask it to jump twice, or to turn left and jump opposite twice. So can it understand the compositional structure of the way that uh, the language works in, in this simplified domain? And we're going to use sequence to sequence neural network models, which is a standard toolkit that's dominant technology for problems like machine translation and question answering in the last few years. It's what powers almost all currently deployed machine translation systems in industry. And the basic way it works is two neural networks working together. There is an encoded neural network shown there on the bottom right in red that reads in the instruction and learns an embedding for it. But for instance, it will embed the instruction jump twice and then it passes messages over to another neural network called the decoder, which then has to transform that into the actions that it needs to produce in order to jump twice. And if this was machine translation, you might be translating between two languages, between the encoder and the decoder. But here, the decoder is going to be producing the actions. So that's the basics behind the scan domain. And just to give you some other details, there's 21,000 commands in the scan data set overall. It was synthetically generated. There's six different primitives. So the network learns how to walk, look around, jump, turn left, and turn right. And then there's a corresponding action primitive for each of those different primitive commands. There are different modifiers, like twice, 
thrice, left, right, around, left, around, right, opposite, left, opposite, right, and conjunctions like and and after. And you can see how this produces a compositional space of possible structures. And there's 21,000 in total because we, we don't allow recursion and so on. So it's not infinite, it's, it's a set of 21,000. And what we found is that if you take one of these modern uh, sequence to sequence models and you train it on a sparse subset of this corpus, right? You just grab 1,600 of the 21,000 commands at random, the networks perform near perfectly in terms of generalization. So they can make zero shot generalizations and correctly perform novel commands as long as the distribution at test is similar to the distribution at training. It doesn't need to see all the commands in order to, to get all the other ones in, in the set, right? It only needs to see a relatively sparse subset, like 8%. But uh, how does it do if the testing is or systematically different than training? So the first problem we looked at is the new uses of jump problem. So can the model generalize to jump twice after learning how to walk twice, run twice, and jump in isolation? So this is the example I. I mentioned uh, in the slide before. So here it's tested on all compositional uses of jump after seeing jump used in just a few settings during training. So the results here are the plot on the bottom right corner of the slide and on the x-axis is the number of times jump was presented in unique examples during training and on the x-axis is the accuracy on new compositional uses of jump. So if you see that jump, if jump is only in one training example just on its own or maybe you get uh, jump around to the left. Uh, performance is terrible. It, it's quite low on generalizing to new commands that use jump. And by 8, 16, 32 examples, it starts to get better. Still not perfect, around 90% you know, with 32 examples. It, it needs more than that to, to get perfect. Eventually it will. So what we can, con can conclude from this is that neural networks have difficulty incorporating a new primitive and show patchy generalization in terms of systematic compositionality. So even networks, you know, one network that we trained that got 32 unique presentations of jump in different contexts, it accuracy is pretty good overall, but the mistakes it made, it always made a mistake if you had jump thrice in an instruction and something else, right? Or jump and something else. So it didn't seem to know what jump thrice or jump meant when combined with something else. But then with that particular network, if you asked it to jump thrice and jump. So you put the two things that didn't seem to know together and ask it to perform that, it actually got it right. So this type of patchy generalization, this patchy cognition doesn't happen in our, our minds when we're learning new words, when we're thinking new thoughts, we don't just have these big gaps in our ability to generalize. And this is part why we're, we're motivated to try to understand what might be different about the architecture of our mind compared to the architecture of our current machine learning tools. We also asked the network to generalize to longer action sequence, sequences than it was trained on. So we trained on all the scan commands that required less than 23 actions to perform correctly. So walk opposite right thrice and jump around left twice and walk opposite right twice are two commands that required less than 23 output actions. And then at test time, we'll take those two sub commands that it already knows about during training and form a new complex command, jump around left twice and walk opposite right thrice that requires 25 actions, say more than it had to perform during training and see how it does. So if you look at the results again on, on the plot to your right on the X axis is the length of the sequence it has to produce at test time. And the Y axis is gonna be the accuracy on these new longer sequences. And you can see it gets a little bit of generalization to sequences that are just a little bit longer than the ones it was trained on, but then it's just a catastrophic failure from length 26 beyond. And these commands, although they're new, they're not really new because they're just compositions of the commands that it already got experience with. All of these commands are familiar in that way. They're composed of subcommands that it's familiar with. So uh, this, this is an important aspect of systematic compositionality and neural networks fail to generalize to novel longer sequences, even with this familiarity on the subcommands. And this has been an issue that's been observed elsewhere with sequence models and recurrent neural networks but it's really critical to the type of productivity we have in language or thought in our minds. So what can we take from this, from SCAN? First, powerful seek to seek models are still far from systematic learners, very useful in practical applications, but not systematic. And when the training and test sets are similar, they can use mix and match strategies in order to solve the problem. And that's in fact what, what it does when you have within distribution tests. But when generalization requires systematic compositional skills, they show critical difficulties 
And if I had to put my finger on exactly what these models are missing, they're missing the ability to learn abstract systematic rules and variables. And this has been talked about by a number of cognitive scientists like Gary Marcus and Steve Pinker and how rules are important for this type of generalization. What you'd really like the networks to be able to do is to take a command like X and Y and treat X and Y as general, genuine variables. So when you translate that into action, you translate X into a do X, right? And then do Y and stick them together, concatenate them together. It doesn't matter what X and Y are. They're, they're variables, they can be anything. And it doesn't seem like these are what, this is what the models do uh, just on their own. And uh, let's, and now we're gonna look to people to try to understand if we can get some insights about how people make compositional generalizations and why our mind might be different. So this was a paper with Tal Lindzen, Marco Baroni, and myself that was at the Cognitive Science Society last year. And here we were interested in why are people better compositional learners than neural networks? So the DAX example in the introduction, right? is suggestive of the fact that people are compositional learners. Sure, you could understand how to DAX twice after I gave you that demonstration, but the argument rests on a thought experiment and we wanted to collect some, some data of people making compositional generalizations to see what the, the ability and structure of that ability really might be. Well, we wanted to create an artificial domain of instructions that was inspired by SCAN, and, but only have a few training patterns. So it's unlike thousands of training patterns like in SCAN so we can actually train people on it. And it's not gonna be enough data to train a standard modern neural network. So just on the order of a handful of patterns in the sequence to sequence problem. We're also gonna try to minimize knowledge of a specific language so we can have human and machines on a relatively even footing. So with this in mind, we created this, for lack of a better term, mini scan data set where the instructions were pseudo words. If you look on the slide, you'll see DAX is a pseudo word, is a primitive. And in this case, it's mapped to th that red action so that the abstract outputs or, or actions are just going to be these these little colored circles so dax is red zuff is yellow lug is blue with is green and then there's also going to be some complex commands like lug flick it with which is blue green blue and with flick it dax which is green red green okay and then at test time uh, participants and again this this is human participants are going to be asked to generalize the new commands like dax flick it zup for instance so i'm going to give you a moment here to to pause and see if you can guess what the right response is for DAX Blick It's Up given the information on the screen. I'm just gonna wait uh, just a moment and see if you can think, think of the answer and then I'll show you the, the correct one. So it can be tough. Uh, participants in the past weren't, weren't uh, time limited, but the right answer in this case is red, yellow, red. So uh, DAX is red and zup is yellow, and blicket is a function. So when you dax zup zap, when you dax blicket zup, it really means you should dax zup dax, or red, yellow, red. Okay, it kind of means like the dax surrounds the zup, or the red surrounds the yellow. So that's what blicket means in this particular case. And here's the complete training and test sets that we gave the human participants. So during training, there was four different primitives, there was three different functions, there were then compositions of functions. There was 14 of these sequence to sequence patterns overall. And then at test time, the human participants were asked to apply a function that they learned from a few examples to novel input variables. If you see over there on the right-hand side, a lot of the test functions use up, which was only presented on its own during training. It's that yellow circle there. So it looks at learning these, these functions and using them on a new input like up and also composing functions together in new ways. And we verified that you take a standard sequence to sequence neural network and train it on, on this data set with just 14 patterns, it performs extremely poorly, the single digit generalization accuracy, because these models are just not meant to, to train on data sets that's small, but nevertheless, people are able to handle it. So here's the design and behavioral experiment. I mentioned there's four primitives. There was a modifier FEP, which is a little bit like thrice. So when you DAX FEP, it means DAX, 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 or red, red, red. Or lug fat that means blue, blue, blue. Blicket, I already mentioned that's a little bit like surround. And key key is another function that is a conjunction, but it means like after. So when you dax key key lug, it means you first you lug blue and then you dax red. And then these can be composed together, right? In 
that you could use multiple functions in a single command. So the instructions that participants got were just that they learn a set of commands and their corresponding outputs, and they produced the outputs, right? They were given commands and they produced the outputs by dragging colors from a pool on the screen into an array that expanded to suit however big the sequence is that they wanted to produce. So they had to generate to actually construct the right output. There was a type of curriculum learning, so participants were taught each of the functions individually and then was, were taught to make compositions of functions. And the training set remained on the screen and uh, this was run on mechanical torque. So I hope that gives you the, a sense of what the experiment looked like with people. And this is what we found. The overall level of performance was quite good. In terms of applying a function to novel input variables, it, performance is around 84% correct for, for people. Again, with like the basic networks were, were quite low in the single digits. And in terms of composing functions together in new ways, participants were about 76% correct. And importantly, in these examples, participants had to produce longer sequences than they had ever seen before during training, exactly what the networks failed on, like sequences of six, more compositions of functions. They were only trained on two function compositions. They could generalize to three. And there was also no, no way in these uh, to get these test commands correct by just substituting one color from the training set. So it always required more leaps than that. And nevertheless, people were able to, to handle it and make these types of systematic generalizations. So just to dive into the results in a little bit more detail, here's the here's one of the trials. This is the one that we all did together in that demonstration deck. Like it's up, which the right answer is red, yellow, red. Again, with plenty of time, 85% of participants were able to get this right. But in terms of the mistakes, we're actually quite interesting and informative. A representative mistake would be this example down here on the bottom of the screen, which is actually red, green, yellow. And it seems that a lot of participants had a type of one-to-one -one bias. Maybe you experienced this when you were trying to figure out what was going on, where they assume that basically each of the words maps to a single output. And thus they'd map DAX to red at the beginning and up to yellow at the end. And then they're like, okay, what's a blicket? Well, blicket's actually a function, but uh, they didn't pick that up. And they, they went and they grabbed the green from the training set and like pulled it down there. And that would, that would be an example of somebody who didn't get it quite right because they had this strong one-to-one -one bias. And that, that was suggested that people may come to these tasks with pretty strong inductive biases. Another example of a, a compositional item here with Kiki's up step. So in order to handle this, first you have to handle the Kiki. Kiki, again, is a conjunction. You do the last thing first and the first thing last. So when you with Kiki zup fep, you use zup fep first. Zup fep means do zup three times or yellow, yellow, yellow. And then you have to go back and do the whiff, which is green. 85% of participants got, got this right. But a representative mistake was actually to do everything right, but to forget to do the last thing first and the first thing last. Instead, to do the first thing first and the last thing last, which is a bit more natural in, in some ways. And again, uh, this type representative mistake suggests that people had a type of iconic concatenation bias. They like to handle the first thing, translate that, then the second thing, then the third thing. They didn't have trouble learning functions that, that swap the order of, of the concatenations. So to summarize, we found hints of inductive biases in people's mistakes. There was this one-to-one -one bias that people, uh, for each input symbol, they, they thought there would just be one corresponding output symbol, so that if you didn't know the meaning of zup and you had to guess between one yellow and two yellows, people would pick the one yellow. Iconic concatenation, a type of first in, first out, that if you had to handle dax up for the first time, you first you should do dax and then you should do zup, even if you had no evidence uh, about the right way to concatenate, that's the natural way for people to do it. And a third bias is actually has a long history in developmental psychology called mutual exclusivity. This idea that if an object already has a name, then it probably doesn't need another name. And this is a bias that children use to help learn words in their native language. And uh, to give you an example here, if you know the red already has the name Dax, and you're trying to figure out what a Zup is, then it probably doesn't also mean red. It could, right? But it probably is the name for something else, like yellow. And this is also implicit in the participant responses because they tended to always do something new for new commands. Again, utilizing this assumption. So here are three key inductive biases that, that seem to be important to how people did this task. And in the second experiment, we wanted to, to really nail this down and test it more directly because we just found those suggested mistakes. So in this experiment, we, we did a pretty radical experiment where we asked people to perform a sequence to sequence task, like the ones that we just talked about with no training examples. So if you're imagining that you're a neural network, this is a little bit wild. It's like asking it to 
make responses in a sequence to sequence or, or machine translation task with no training examples, just a vanilla network, right? And of course, a neural network would just spit out nothing because it doesn't have strong inductive biases. But people, uh, we, want, we wondered maybe they do. So we just gave them a worksheet like this and said, here are some commands, guess their outputs. So guess what a zup is, or a zup zup, or a dax up, or a with blicket, uh, is up with blicket, and gave them these pool of possible outputs, and at, and then went and looked to see what they did, and it turns out people produced very structured responses even with no relevant training data, and that about 60% of participants responded exactly some analogous way to the way I'm showing you on the slide where they assigned some meaning to ZUP like green and then ZUP ZUP is two greens and then ZUP TUFA is a green and a yellow. So they'd assign a unique meaning for each word and usually that meaning was just a single symbol so that following one to one and then they concatenate in the natural way so they can concatenate in the first in first out style way. So almost everyone showed these three inductive biases 100%. 60% uh, of the part participants did. But not everybody, and there, there are some al interesting alternatives. So here's a participant that actually followed ME and con iconic concatenation, but not one-to-one. -one. They, they mapped the blicket to two symbols, and actually, uh, when I showed this in a talk, uh, somebody mentioned that what, what this participant was doing was mapping the number of symbols to actually the number of syllables in the word. So people had some interesting hypotheses that when what we're doing the computational modeling, it's, it's unlikely our model is going to consider all the hypotheses that people did because people have some, some quite interesting ones. But here's just to give you another example of a, a reasonable uh, guess, of course, there's no right answer here, that followed two out of the three inductive biases. Okay. More than a source of error, these biases provide critical inductive constraints. So I, I talked about them you know, first as, as errors people made, but I think they're far more important than causes for errors. And that if you interpret these instructions as non-compositional holes. If, if you don't try to think about how they decompose into primitives and functions and so on, then there's no basis to generalize. You have no basis to generalize the new commands, especially when you have a small data set like that. And these biases suggest that people come into a new problem, understanding that words have unique and consistent meanings and they follow certain input output constraints. And I think this, this is highly important to why people are able to make these sophisticated generalizations uh, much better from just a few examples, much better than our neural networks do after thousands of examples. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the, the last piece, which is what are the computational underpinnings of human compositional skills? And I'm gonna tell you about a neural network model that we're going to work on improving its compositional generalization abilities. In particular, we're going to teach it to be more compositional. So this was a paper that I published at NeurIPS last year, if you want to read more about the details of this architecture. Well, first, just to say a little bit about the goals of the computational framework. We wanted a structured neural network model, this, this is what we were, were after, that learns new primitives and uses them compositionally, can encode human inductive biases, the, the same ones that we just talked about, and capture that rich starting point so that when it faces a new task, it's more like the human participants in terms of its compositional learning abilities. In this case, we're gonna use meta-learning in order to teach it to be more compositional and to encode that type of prior knowledge. But we don't in intend uh, the model to do some things in that the way the model learns is not an explanation of the developmental process by which people come to this rich starting point. And it doesn't resolve whether people have some innate structure in their architecture or whether they're learning it instead. Uh, but we're just trying to capture the starting point people have when they come into a new task. So with this goal in mind, I pr proposed a framework called MetaSeq to Seek Learning or meta sequence to sequence learning, and, and I mentioned this was at NeurIPS last year. And the key idea is that compositional skills, rather than building them in, we're going to try to acquire them through meta learning with a structured memory augmented neural network. So I, I told you what we wanted this network to do. We wanted it to be able to learn new primitives, use them compositionally, use the type of inductive bias these people have, so it has this rich starting point. So in essence, if it was faced with a task like the one below, we'd, we'd like it to do the following. We'd like it to be able to look at these four different primitives, Dax, Lug, Wiff, and Blicket, and what they map to, and then be able to use them compositionally to solve test types. So that if it was asked to Dax, Lug, uh, even though with no direct evidence, it would know the first the Dax red and then Lug blue. Or if it's asked to Zup, well, Zup actually is not in that training set or support set in meta learning. 
it, Zup, it has no direct evidence about what it means. But if you use mutual exclusivity, you can tell that actually there's one unused output symbol. There, yellow hasn't, doesn't have a name yet. And that's probably, Zup is probably the name for yellow. So we'd wanted to make that inference, which again, that children uh, you know, at the age of three and four uh, will we'll make this inference and adults readily make it as well. And then actually be able to use that compositionally as well. So if you whip up, then you green and then yellow. So we'd like it to be able to produce those responses over there on the right-hand side of just, just with minimal training data over there on the left. So to capture this type of prior knowledge through meta-learning, is, is what we're after here. And like meta-learning more generally, learning just doesn't happen on one static data set. Instead, learning is distributed over a sequence of dynamically changing data sets called episodes that encourage a type of compositional generalization. So what this means is that there's a bunch of little data sets and the first episode might give you three primitives with a different meaning for them, right? DAX might be red with blue and so on. And then the network encodes these called support items, the training set for that little episode. And it has to make generalizations to the query set. And we're going to train it to be a better generalizer. And that we're going to evaluate its ability to respond to the queries. If it gets it wrong, that's the loss function is calculated there. And then we're going to do back propagation. And then it gets another episode where the world now works differently. And now DAX might mean green and LUG might mean yellow and so on. And then it gets evaluated on queries and we're going to do back propagation. But after enough of these training episodes with permuted meanings where the world works differently for each one, we're going to give it this test episode where the mapping is now completely new and see how it performs. So just to, to explain the architecture, uh, the, it's processing an episode, the one there on the top left. So there's four support items, DAX, LUG, WIF, and ZUP, and they have their corresponding meanings. And then it's going to be asked to query, like, what's the right output for a WIF blicket? Now, a WIF blicket, WIF is actually one of the items in the support set, and it means green. So WIF should be translated to green. But, and now for Blicket, Blicket is not in the support set. So you have to use that mutual exclusivity reasoning and to infer that it's the thing that doesn't have a name yet, which is purple. So that's what we'd like our network to do. And I want to explain how the network is able to do it. So on the right-hand side, you'll notice it's just in that pink box. It's just a standard sequence to sequence model. We're going to take an RNN. It's going to read in the input command with Blicket. And it's going to pass messages to the decoder, which has attention, and it's going to attend over those messages in order to translate it to the right outputs, green and purple. So if you just look at that right-hand side, that's just the standard model that doesn't, that it doesn't do very well on scan, uh, but, but is a very typical technology in machine learning. And this is never going to work for this, because the meaning of the words change every episode. So you can't encode it in the weights. It has to use uh, external memory. So there in the, the orange box is external memory, which is an augmentation to the network. And that the, when the RNN encoder is passing messages to the decoder, it gets passed through this external memory and then infuses the messages so that they become contextualized in what the particular support set is for that episode. And then the decoder can use that to get the right answer. So the external memory is a, is a key value memory where the keys are the different items in the support set, their input. So DAX, LUG, WIF, and ZUP are all keys. And then their values in the key value memory or encodings of the, the different outputs that they map to, red, blue, green, and yellow. Well, I'm going to go through the step through how it's going to respond to this query with Blicket. So first, we're going to put in WIP over there on the bottom right of the screen. That gets passed uh, to the encoder. And now that's going to pass a vector, an embedding, over to the memory. And that memory, uh, that, that query, right, WIF is going to be compared to all the different keys in the memory. And it's going to get a very strong response to the WIF key because WIF is actually in the memory. It was in the support set. And what that means, the key value memory is going to return a strong response to the green value because that was what was associated with WIF. And now all the decoder has to do is learn to interpret what's coming out of its memory, in this case, the output of green from reading what the context is that comes out of the memory. Now comes along the next step, which is Blicket. Now Blicket gets compared to all the different keys in the memory. And what you'll see is that it doesn't fit any of the keys well. It's going to have a very blurry, even attention over all the cells because Blicket isn't in there. And thus, it's, the memory is going to return a blurry mix of all the different values, all the different colors, because it doesn't have a, a nice a, a attention over a single cell because Blicket wasn't in there. And now what the network has to do, it needs to learn that when I get a blurry retrieval from my memory, I should map that to something new. 
And if it's able to do that, if it's able to learn that, it's going to be able to succeed and capture these inductive biases. And in particular, it has to map it to the new thing. And the, the way it knows it's new is because it doesn't participate in that blur. That blur is a mix of red, blue, green, and yellow, but there's no purple. So it should map that to purple. And it turns out this is exactly what this neural network will learn. This is the solution that it finds. And, and it finds it after if you train it on thousands of episodes of like different ways the world could work, these words have different meanings. And then you evaluate it on new test episodes with novel meanings. Uh, it, it aces it with 100% accuracy and can demonstrate that you can learn uh, an inductive bias that for this new episode, right, it can show ME, it shows one to one, and it shows iconic concatenation. It can, it can uh, show the types of inductive biases that people do when they're making generalizations on the same type of data. But I want to go back to scan, right? Scan is that talent problem that we started with earlier. And here we're going to feed in all the support items that are actually instructions and scan. So the support items might be run twice and walk twice and look twice and jump. Okay, and then we, the query is jump twice. So in the context of that particular support set, we want the network to be able to use that in order to better understand how to jump twice by using its memory and meta loop. But how we actually do this is we train on thousands of episodes where we use different versions of the scan data set in that we take scan, we, we sample, 20 support commands for that particular episode from the scan a set of 20,000 instructions. And then we permute the meaning of the words, especially the primitives, they get assigned new meanings. And thus the network has to learn to use its support set to quickly figure out the meaning of new words and then use that to respond to query instructions in the scan. So it's trained like that through thousands of episodes where the meaning of, of these primitives gets permuted. And then at test time, all we have to do is show it, okay, jump, now finally means this, jump maps to the jump action, walk to walk, run to run, look to look. It, it, it gets assigned the, the real meaning of these primitives, and it has to quickly use that in order to make these compositional generalizations to new uh, uses of jump. And it's able to do that with meta-learning, so near 100% correct on scan. And if you take away the memory, you take away the decoder attention, you take away an additional loss that helps it know how to read things out of its memory and what it's storing in memory, it, the system doesn't work anymore. So you really do need all these components and you need this training so that it learns to generalize more compositionally. And another interesting aspect of it is that it needs to learn what information to store in its weights in the weights of the neural network versus what it should use its memory for. The things that are constantly changing in the world, you wanna put in your memory, but then the things that are stable and the meaning of some of the words like twice and thrice were stable across the episodes, those you can use its weight for. And it learns to strike the right balance in terms of what, which of its resources it should use in order to make rapid compositional generalizations. So to bring us back to the DAX example that we started with, both people in the model can learn a new verb and use it compositionally. So this is just what the jump task in the scan data set shows is that it would, would jump and its meaning presented just in, in isolation or in a few cases it can then use that compositionally, just like a person can do with DAX. So of course, it's highly simplified. It's, it's a very simple sequence to sequence problem. It's not like you know, a live multimodal demonstration. Another limitation of the model is that it needs to see all the input and output symbols. It needs to see them in lots of different combinations, but it needs to practice with using all of them. It can't handle a genuinely new symbol, which is another challenge that uh, cognitive science has opposed to neural networks as well. And that, that remains unsolved. So if we look at the other tasks in the scan data set, the scan data set is a whole suite of different types of generalizations. I mentioned it can do adding jump very well. It can add around right and from just a few examples and use it compositionally. But importantly, those length tasks that I mentioned where it has to generalize the longer sequences that it did during training, uh, that it's, it's hardly any better than just the vanilla sequence to sequence model. So the meta learning, I was unable to get it to be better at generalizing the longer sequences through meta-learning, and this remains one of the more challenging aspects of SCAN, although one I think we can make some progress on with the concentrated data. So let's step back and look at where we've gotten in this talk. I mentioned that we were aiming for a framework that can learn new primitives and use them compositionally, can encode human-like inductive biases, and capture through meta-learning the rich starting point that people have when they come into a new task. So all these, the, this meta-seek-to-seek -seek approach is able to do. 
But in terms of limitations, I mentioned they can't handle genuinely new primitives. It can only handle new meanings of those primitives. And what we want to do next is to try to make detailed predictions and see if we can understand how people make those compositional generalizations in language like learning tasks. Can we explain both the successes of people and also their failures in terms of an account like this? And another remaining open question is, how do these abilities develop? And how do people come to this rich starting point? What aspects are potentially built-in components of the architecture versus what aspects of compositionality might actually be learned through the developmental process? So what's next? I mentioned that we're pushing to try to model human compositional learning and see if we can get more insights that can help us solve novel problems in AI and NLP. And what we're doing is, is seeing if we can meta-train on the human inductive bias data. We have all this data about how people generalize with very little data. See if we can soak up those inductive biases in the meta seek to seek approach and then use that to make predictions about how people are learning new words. So that we reached the end and I just want to circle back to the question that we started with. The main question was how do people uh, do these comp do compositional generalization? What are the computational underpinnings of human compositional skills? So in part one, I showed you that powerful seek to seek models, although extremely successful in machine learning and NLP, they fail spectacularly when systematic compositional skills are required. And in part two, we looked at people and showed that people can learn new concepts and apply them in new ways to new input variables and also new compositions of things they already know. And people seem to rely on at least three key inductive biases in order to solve sequence to sequence tasks like this. And in part three, we inspired by these findings with humans, we uh, developed a structured memory augmented network that can perform few shot learning and capture human inductive biases. And I see this as a very promising framework for understanding people and informing engineering efforts to build more human like AI systems that can make more human like forms of compositional generalization. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Brendan. That was a very interesting talk. So, yeah, uh, let me pass the mic to Xin Yin, who's going to lead the Q&A. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, hi, so I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and also thanks, Brendan, a lot for the very inspiring talk. So, uh, we get a couple of interesting questions here. So, uh, first, I would like to... Um, um, ask uh, Debbie Murphy, do you want to ask your question about like uh, human experiments? If you want, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, could uh, could could someone? Uh, yeah, you? David, you, you're a mute. Unmuted. Okay, cool. Can you speak? Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Ah, uh, great. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Brandon. It's very interesting. And I was curious, particularly in the beginning, when you were talking about some of the compositional structure and figuring that out from experience, whether uh, children are better or worse at this task than adults. Do children exhibit more or less freedom in coming up with these rules, or do they have different biases than adults? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. And it really jumps to the heart of like, where these things might come from. So the, sh the short answer is, uh, we don't know. We haven't run this with kids. That would be fascinating to do. It would be great to get, find a collaborator that would like to do this. I think some of the inductive biases children are, are certainly going to show if you test them at the right age. As I mentioned, like the mutual exclusivity bias, which is very important here, uh, that uh, is typically shown very strongly by the ages of three or four in, in children. And it's a key component to how they learn language. When they get a new word and there's something new in their environment, they just immediately associate those two things, right? And that, that really limits the hypothesis space. But for some of these, I, I do think children are gonna show them. The broader question about our compositional skills and are these sort of built-in parts of the architecture of the mind or uh, do they develop or are they learned? I, I wish, I think that's one of the most interesting questions here. And uh, we, we really should tackle it head on. And I, I think there's a real case to be made that 
aspects of it might be learned through development. If, if you look at infants, there's been some experiments with compositional generalization in infancy by Steve Pantadosi and Dick Aslan, where they, they had some experiments where they had a little toy car that goes through like a magical box. And these are like six month old infants. So they, they, you, you don't, can't ask them to do anything in terms of language or explicit response, right? You just watch whether they're surprised or not. And they watch cars go through these little boxes and some cars are paint, some of the boxes are painted red and those boxes will transform the car it's so that it's red if it comes out the other side and others are star spangled. And thus, if the car goes through, it has stars printed on the outside. And then the critical test trial is you show that a, a car going through two boxes at once, right? So one that transforms the color and the other that adds the stars. And you would see what they expect. And they don't, <laughs> at that age, six months, they don't expect the car to come out with both transformations. And so that's uh, young, younger uh, toddlers or, or older toddlers will, will make that expectation, but the youngest infants at, at least didn't have that capacity at the month they, at the age that they looked at. So I, I think it's, it's possible that some of these things develop and, and there could be a good reason why a, a child wants to learn to be more compositional because they're constantly hearing new words. Children learn about 10 words a day from after they start speaking to the end of high school. And once they learn a new word, they have to use it right away. They have to understand it used in different ways. They, they want to be able to say it right away. So there's, I think in the loss function, if, if that's the way you want to think about it, there is a pressure to generalize compositionally during development. And that might be part of the answer. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so uh, we have another question uh, from also, uh, Pedro about the uh, human experiments uh, also. So, uh, oh, so would you like to ask your questions? Um, um, or, or I can also read out the question for you. Okay, then I guess I can I can read the question. So the question is uh, is uh, related to like um whether the inductive bias like um it, um uh, revealed by human participants uh, was because uh some people may anticipate uh, may expect that they are trying to name name the colors. So uh, do you know like what kinds of uh, inductive bias they would have displayed if they have been told that uh, not all the words are uh, color names? So basic colors are just like different ways to like um. The, 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 like to describe the primitives. Yeah, that's that's a good question, and we we should swap out the the colors with like a different feature and try it again to see if there's something special about color. What uh, we did do, uh, we did a bunch of other experiments. So if you look at that Cogsci paper, you you can see the additional experiments that we did, where we we ha rather I told you about like a learning task and then a completely freeform task where they could. Uh, had no constraints or, or no relevant data. We had some intermediate cases where we gave them just one or two examples of, say, how, to, how the meaning of one of the instructions and asked them to make generalizations. And in some cases, we did um, we, we did pit different forces together. Like we we only showed we only allowed them two colors, and there were three words. So there were cases where we we kind of forced them to go beyond the inductive biases that they had, and. You're, if you're suggesting that there's a strong preference to have one word for each color, there really, there really is. Like people prefer to do that. They, they only didn't do that if you really forced them to uh, in the learning experiments say. But they, they can go beyond that. They can learn a more abstract functional meaning for some of these words. And uh, I, I think it, it is more, my, my personal uh, prediction would be it's more about this one-to-one -one constraint that we expect words have unique and consistent meanings and it is special about colors. But the, the way to really nail that down would be to, to do that again with a different feature. Thanks for the mm -hmm. question. Yeah, great, thanks. And then uh, we also have some questions about like um, how you like uh, inject the inductive bias into the models and also what are like different alternatives to like kind of encode this inductive bias. So I would like to start with the question from uh, Yu Xiang Wu. So uh, would you like to ask the question yourself? Uh, um, could you like uh, raise your hand if you want? Okay, cool. So uh, could someone unmute him? Oh, hey, um, can you hear me? 
yeah we can yeah so yeah thanks for thanks for the talk and so regarding the uh, third part that you have this like uh, augmented uh, memory uh, memory module in that network i think that is also injected the uh, one of the biases which is the one to one uh, as you mentioned uh, as you refer to it like so it's kind of like you are doing uh, you, uh, you, you injected that in the experiment and without that it just doesn't work uh, so which um, makes me curious about like how is it how much are we in I mean in those experiments right is it that we uh, injected our biases already um, and is it possible that these models could learn without any biases that's injected by the researchers of uh, that designed this neural network. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And I, I think it's one of the most interesting issues is where do these inductive biases come from, uh, both in our minds, but what is the right way? What is the best way to incorporate them into our machine learning models? And we, per, I'm not putting all my, my eggs in one basket here and, and that I, I think uh, there are compelling reasons to think that uh, there, there are we don't have quite the right architecture yet that there, there could be, there, there are benefits of having architectures that actually build in more structure. And then there's also benefits to having architectures that learn more from scratch. And I, I, I see the meta seek to seek approach as definitely more on the from scratch side and, and that it, it has some very bare bones inductive bias in it in that it has this key value memory augmentation and uh, it has a notion of like variables that that this key value memory facilitates. And the more structured models that we've looked at are ones that are more like neural symbolic approaches. We, we have a, a submitted paper that actually is very similar. It does meta learning, but it act, rather than try to directly answer the queries, it tries to infer the underlying symbolic grammar behind scan or behind some permuted version of scan, and then uses that to answer the questions. And in that case, there's a lot more inductive bias that actually has this sort of symbolic language of thought, if, if you will. Uh, but for, for those cases, it, uh, it, 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 it has more built in, but it can do more. It, like in, that, in those cases, it can go completely handle the longer action sequences problem because it actually has symbolic rules and variables. Now, uh, I don't think one-to-one, -one, which was part of your question, is actually built in to the meta seek to seek approach. And, Definitely from this picture, it kind of looks like there's a one-to-one a -one built in, like the DAX is red and the lug is blue. But that's more from the nature of this particular, uh, this particular task, right? That there's a lot of these one-to-one -one mappings. All the mappings are one-to-one, -one actually. In scan, they're not. In scan, some of the words are one-to-one, -one, but others, like twice, are functions. And uh, yeah, I should should point out that you, you can just read a single symbol into the key value memory, but you can actually read in a whole sequence. So here, like walk twice is you embed the whole sequence and then you put that as the key and then its output, which is actually two symbols, walk walk is the value. So the this system is perfectly com compatible with ways the world works that aren't one-to-one. -one. In fact, it'll just as readily learn ways the world works that aren't one-to-one -one, um, as worlds where they are, are one-to-one. -one. So in that sense, I think this, this is a pretty tabula rasa way to, to think about it beyond the fact that there's has these rules of uh, these these variables built into the key value memory and uh, the reason why it shows these human inductive biases is because we train it to have uh, those inductive biases and I really see meta learning as a tool for potentially putting inductive biases in models that are really hard to build into your architecture and, and like the easiest way is to build them into your data set and to, to train them to have the same biases that you have in your than synthetic data set. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, uh, since there are also some participants asking about like neural symbolic techniques, so I would like to uh, ask uh, something about that. So basically, I see that here, um, you, you uh, basically in your talk, you present about like meta learning to learn this kind of one-to-one uh, -one mapping and some other human inductive biases. But uh, my understanding is that um, in, in the follow up what you just mentioned, so basically you are saying that by learning some symbolic rules, it can kind of help to generalize to longer sequences. So it kind of like um, basically 
the techniques from the training side and architectural side are kind of helping the model to learn uh, some uh, better uh, biases from different perspectives. So like, uh, would you like to give a uh, like more high level uh, summary of like, um, uh, basically what aspects of techniques do you think may be um, more important to like um, encode some like uh, better biases or they are kind of um, uh, complementary with each other? Yeah, great question. To, 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 to say a little bit more about that, sort of I have extra slides somewhere. Yeah, so uh, this, if you're interested in neural symbolic uh, a version of these ideas, you should check out the, it's a submitted paper by Maxwell Nye. And the, the key idea that I mentioned, like at the top of the slide is an example of the meta seek to seek approach where it, it learns some neural embedding of the support examples and uses that to answer queries. So in the bottom part, what it does, it learns neural embeddings of support examples, and then the decoder actually produces an underlying grammar that tries to explain it. And I think that a beautiful thing about this, this idea, in addition to the stronger inductive bias, is that what, if you have a neural symbolic model like this, you can actually do a guess and check type inference at test time. So, so you, it actually, it doesn't have to get it right, right off the bat. If, if you're doing it just with a purely neural model, you pass in the query and then whatever comes out the other end, that's your answer, right? It, you just have to go with that. But with this neuro symbolic guess and check, you produce the symbolic grammar, you use your neural decoder to try to guess what that underlying symbolic structure is. And then you can go back and check. You can run it on the, the support examples. And if it doesn't match, you just throw away that output of the neural net and you produce another one. So it doesn't get it right on the first try, but say within a few tries, it, it finds something that matches the support examples very well. And in that case, it always generalizes perfectly to new examples. But when I think about what people are doing and, and to get like to the, the harder question, um, see you in about whether, which, which are people doing? What's the right way to, to have inductive biases? I, I think people are somewhere in between these things. I don't think either one of those approaches is strictly the right answer. And that what really looks like is going on to me in the human data is that sometimes people can figure out the abstract rule and they really do use it in an abstract way. And other times they learn some of the rules, but others they just don't figure it out. And they kind of muddle along with something statistical or they grab bits and pieces of the training set and kind of use that to assemble a reasonable answer. And that's often what you see when people rely on those inductive biases, like the one-to-one, -one, even when there's functions that made it so it really wasn't one-to-one. -one. But what people seem to be doing, they, it's almost like if, if you know Dan, Daniel Kahneman's system one versus system two, I think there's a system two that is doing more symbolic reasoning, actually trying to learn the abstract rules, and then a more intuitive guess that might be more like the meta seek to seek learning. And uh, it, to, to really understand both facets of the way we generalize, we're going to need models that do both that say sometimes learn these crisp rules, but other times they fall back more on statistical strategies. And there might be very good reasons to, to have an approach like that. And it's, it's worth uh, considering or machine learning. Yeah. Too. yeah, right. I think it is also like part of the beauty for like uh, symbolic approaches. Basically, it allows us to kind of verify our hypothesis. Okay. Um, so uh, next, I will we want to uh, go into some questions about uh, kind of how to uh, combine these uh, like techniques with like some more modern uh, architectures such as transformer. So uh, James uh, Hammer's turn, to, would you like to ask your, the question yourself? Um, yeah, cool, cool, someone unmuting. Hi, um, uh, so thanks Brendan for a very interesting talk and so, uh, um, and so the other question is some very interesting questions there. So, um, so you're using recurrent neural networks in your experiments, um, but of course uh, in natural language processing, the transformer um, has become a very strong uh, uh, performer uh, and, uh, and is producing state-of-the-art results for uh, numerous tasks now. So I was wondering what uh, differences you would expect to arise if you were to try and use transformer-based encoders and decoders in, in this sort of work. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great question. And well, in, in short, there it was scan originally, not, not in this meta learning version, but was scan. The, at the time, trans, we were working on transformers were, were just catching on and they weren't in the original paper, but other groups have looked at transformers on scan uh, to and see if they perform any better. And uh, they, 
they have in some cases, but just marginally. So it, transformers are not somehow compositional in the way that recurrent neural networks are, are not. They're, they both have very much the same issues. So I, I think it's important to point out that just those developments certainly on their own uh, don't, don't solve this problem. Now, if, if for the meta seek to seek learning, you could very well take out the RNNs and the seek to seek and replace it with transformers. But for this, on this slide in particular, this neural memory embedding, which is the meta seek to seek RNN setup currently, you could replace that with a transformer. And you, you could actually use a transformer, a, a structured transformer. Uh, uh, this has some attention that's much more, the key and values are very structured here in a way that they're not in a transformer. But you could make a transformer version. And I've tried to incorporate ideas from transformers into other uh, versions of this architecture when, when I was exploring it. And I didn't find any, any uh, special success with replacing components with transformers. It didn't work any better, worked worse in some cases. And, and uh, it, that is consistent with what others have found that transformers often don't, don't give you a lot of benefits on relatively small data sets that you know, they really shine on the GPT-3 scale training and, and BERT scale training and so on. If you were to apply this in an in, in application to like massive scale NLP tasks, and I think you, these ideas could, could be very important for that, then I think using transformers would be a smart move. But for the problems we're looking at, we, we didn't find it to be helpful. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks, thanks for the uh, uh, answers. Uh, and I guess uh, we, we are already running out of our time. So uh, unfortunately, we may, we may not be able to like, go into all the questions. But uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. And also, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, very like, inspiring uh, um, questions from the audience as well.